When solving linear elastic boundary value problems by hand, so using analytical methods, there are three fundamental techniques that people use to solve these types of problems. So one is something known as the Navier form, the displacement form uh, method. Another one is called the semi-inverse method. And the third one is through the use of something known as stress functions. And in this uh, video, I'd like to kind of go over the philosophy for each one of these three different techniques and just kind of give you an idea of how they work. So the, the boundary value problem itself is we have a body B, we have two parts of the boundary S1 and S2. So on S1 the displacements are given U hat and on S2 the tractions are given so t hat and u hat are known, and we're trying to s satisfy the equations in the body that the divergence of the stress plus the body force is equal to zero, that the stress is equal to the elastic modulus times the strains, and that the strains themselves are the symmetric gradient of the displacements. So those are our fundamental equations that need to be satisfied along with the two boundary conditions there. And so in the Navier method of doing things, uh, what we do is we start with the equilibrium equation. And what we do is we substitute, first we substitute in the stress-strain relationship, so we get equilibrium in terms of strains. And then we substitute in the strain-displacement relationship, so we get an expression for equilibrium in terms of the displacements. And so what we have here now are we, we've combined up the three governing equations and we have one set of equations. In fact, if we write this initially, what we see is that there's one free index. So there are three equations here and there are three unknowns in the equation, U1, U2, and U3. And what we have is a set of three second order partial differential equations, second order because there's two derivatives present and they're coupled together. So the first equation involves all three displacements, as does the second and the third. And so with Navier's form, this is the partial differential equation now that you solve. You solve for the displacements. And then once you know the displacements, it's easy to evaluate the strains and the stresses. And when you solve this equation, you need to impose the boundary conditions so that the, the displacements are equal to u hat on S1 and that the tractions are equal to t hat on S2. And I've written out the expression for the tractions here in terms of the displacements. So C U K comma L is the same as C acting on epsilon K L. I've taken advantage of minor symmetry of the moduli there to write it this way. So that's the stress. And so we have stress times the normal is equal to t hat. Uh, now these PDEs are not at all easy to solve this way, but uh, for select problems, you can approach uh, a solution using the Navier form of the governing equation, uh, especially when there's a lot of symmetry to the problem. So you know, for instance, that the motion, suppose you had a sphere with uh, internal pressure or something, then you know the motion is radial. So there's only a radial displacement and you know it only depends on the radial coordinate. And so you can, use symmetry and other information about the boundary value problem to simplify uh, Navier's uh, basic equations here, which in general are, are pretty challenging to solve straight up using uh, classical methods of partial differential equations. But this is one technique. So, and it's usually employed when there's a lot of symmetry to the geometry and a lot of symmetry to the load. Now, Another technique that is used quite often is something known as a semi-inverse method. And in this technique, what you do is you guess a form of the solution with some unknown parameters and functions in it. So you kind of, instead of just saying I need a, a general function u1 and a general function u2 and a general function u3, you say, well, I know something about how those functions are going to behave. And so, for instance, if when you have the torsion of, of a bar, uh, a classical assumption based on experimental observation is that there's motion in the three direction that only depends on the one, two coordinates. And so we have a guess. We say that, okay, U3 is equal to some function of X1 and X2. 
And then also from observation, we see that the in-plane motion is actually just like a rigid body rotation in the plane. And so we can write down the functional form for that in terms of, of parameters here, which I've called alpha. So this is what's meant by the semi-inverse method. So you, you, you make a guess for what the displacement field looks like. Uh, and in that guess, you have unknowns. So in this case, there's an unknown parameter, alpha, and an unknown function, phi. And then the objective or the idea behind the semi-inverse method now is to find governing equations for alpha and phi uh, so that you can actually complete the solution. So you get a governing equation, you solve that governing equation. And what usually happens in the situation is the governing equation is quite a bit simpler than, say, what you have just by looking at the Navier form of the equations in terms of the displacements. So which in this particular case, I've, I've, I've made a, a guess for the displacements, so I would evaluate the strains in terms of the displacements. And so that would give me strains in terms of alpha and phi. And then knowing that, I could evaluate the stresses, and I would then get the stresses in terms of alpha and phi. And next, I could insert that result into the equilibrium equation, and I would get equilibrium in terms of the parameters alpha and phi. And at this stage, what you typically typically get is a tractable, tract, tractable equation for phi and alpha. So, and, and really here, the, you know, the primary goal of, of the semi-inverse method is to convert the complicated Navier form for the displacements to something simpler for alpha and phi. And then uh, in this particular case, I, 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 I apply the semi-inverse method here to the torsion of a non-circular bar and what you end up getting is actually Laplace's equation for phi. And the boundary conditions for that Laplace equation come from the boundary conditions to the original problem in terms of the tractions and the applied torque. So this, this is the idea behind the semi-inverse method. You make a guess of the form of the solution, and then you look at its consequences. Hopefully, those consequences result in a simpler equation for the unknowns in your guess. And this can facilitate solutions. Uh, now, sometimes you can't satisfy all the boundary conditions and all the equations, and that just simply means that your guess wasn't the right guess, and you have to go back and make a new guess. So that's the semi-inverse method. Uh, the last classical technique that's pretty common is known as the stress function method. Uh, and this is useful for cases with one or two active uh, equilibrium equations. So for example, in, in the torsion problem, there's only one non-trivial equilibrium equation, or in plane problems, there are only two active equilibrium equations. And when you have situations like this, you can actually set things up uh, so that these equations are automatically satisfied. So what you do is you make an assumption to render the equilibrium equation satisfied. And in particular for the torsion problem, if I just declare the two stress components that appear in the torsion problem to be particular derivatives of an unknown function psi, this assumption here automatically renders the equilibrium equation in torsion satisfied. And the same thing happens in the plane problem. If I make this particular assumption for the stress components in terms of function phi, if I plug this assumption into the equilibrium equations for the plane problem, you'll see that the plane equilibrium equations are identically satisfied. Now, psi and phi are unknown functions. They're called stress functions. The psi here is sometimes known as the parental stress function, and the phi here is usually known as the airy stress function. And so the advantage here is that the equilibrium equation is automatically satisfied. And then, but of course, this was just uh, an assumption here. You still need to figure out what the stress function is to be able to say something about what, say, what the stresses or the strains are. Uh, and the way this is done is by looking at compatibility. So, so we have a form for the stresses, and what we do is we next look at compatibility. So the curl, the curl, the strain being equal to zero. 
and we use that to generate an equation for the stress function. So, so you need to use the constitutive law to convert the stresses uh, to strains, but that would then give you strains in terms of the stress function. You plug it into this compatibility relationship, and that then generates an equation for the stress function. So, for instance, if you have the plane problem, the compatibility equation reduces down to this single partial differential equation here, uh, say for plane strain. And if I plug in my assumption up here, uh, so I had to first convert the stresses for this, I need to convert the strains into expressions in terms of the stresses, say uh, one plus E over nu sigma minus uh, nu over E trace sigma identity. So this would, I could substitute in for the stresses here in terms of the stress functions, and then I could plug that all into this relationship here, and out would pop an equation for the stress function. So in the plane case, what you actually get is the Laplacian of the Laplacian of the area stress function is equal to zero. So this is called the biharmonic equation. Uh, when you do the torsion case, you end up with Poisson's equation. So you get classical equations of, of mathematical physics. And then you can now apply techniques such as separation of variables. So that's one common method then for solving these classical equation separation variables, or Fourier series methods are quite powerful too. So, so these are uh, good ways for solving uh, elastic boundary value problems. If you have, say, torsion problems or plane problems, it's quite effective. You can use these classical methods to come up with a solution to the problem. Notice here that I'm doing this in terms of stresses and strains. Uh, you can go and get the displacements. It's a little trickier because once you get this, once you solve for the stress function, you have the stresses and you have the strains, but then you have to integrate the strains to get the displacements. That step is can be quite challenging. So often when using stress function methods, people only look at getting the stresses and strains, but it is possible to also get the displacements if you really need to, though you have to put a little bit of extra hard work in to do that.